Uh, all right, look at that. Scanning electron micrograph of a tongue. Pretty gorgeous. Um, we, we did a little bit of experiment with the tongue. Um, and so this is something you're very familiar with, the five uh, chemical families of taste, sweet, umami, salty, sour, and bitter. We, we played with this in the lab a little bit, didn't we? Um, <clears throat> and they're distributed across uh, the various regions of the, of the tongue uh, equally. The way the brain is able to interpret them is with this labeled line code. So labeled line code uh, states that in any given taste uh, bud that, or, or, or uh, sensory receptor, taste bud that's in one of these uh, sensory papilla or taste papilla, uh, there are sensory receptors for each of the five uh, tastes and that the brain interprets what it is that you just tasted uh, because it maps that um, it maps that sensory receptor into it into your uh, what's called gustatory cortex, the part of your brain, that little nub in right there, which is uh, devoted to your sense of of taste. Um, So that the whole sense of taste uh, has two separate, uh, evolutionarily separate uh, circuits. There's one on the pre-sulcal and post-sulcal tongue. Has anybody like stuck their tongue way out and looked at it in the mirror? Really looked at your tongue deep uh, back there? Well, if, for those of you who have, you'll notice there's this thing called the sulcus. The sulcus just means a furrow. Uh, there's a furrow along uh, the back margin of your tongue, and the taste, and we have taste from both the front and the back, pre and post sulcal um, taste. And they have two separate uh, nerves that serve the, the front and the back of the tongue uh, the, the facial nerve and the glossopharyngeal nerve, uh, which both ascend to the uh, gustatory cortex, and the cortex processes it and then sends efferent or motor or action uh, s signals down from the gustatory cortex to the salivary glands, completing this circuit. So afferent means sensory, moving up to the brain. Efferent is motor, uh, it's action that's going to be taken and comes down from the brain. Uh, those same nerves from the pre and post sulcal tongue conduct motor uh, neurons down to the, the uh, salivary glands. So there is the parotid gland, which is that gland when you bite into a lemon and you feel kind of bad, like this, like you kind of go cringy in the in, back in the angle of your jaw. That's the parotid gland sort of shivering. Um, and it brings saliva into the back of the mouth. Uh, it's kind of a serous, watery secretion. And then there's the pre tongue, which has the submandibular and sublingual glands. These are the ones toward, that bring saliva into the front of your mouth. If you ever looked into your mouth and stuck your tongue, lifted your tongue and looked under it, you see these little papilla, these little uh, holes um, uh, on these little mounds underneath uh, on either side of the lingual frenulum, the little tag that connects your tongue to the floor of your mouth. Um, and the saliva there uh, can either be uh, sort of watery or it can be kind of mucousy, depending upon which of these glands. And each of these glands has slightly different composition, brings a different type of saliva into the mouth. Um, yeah. So, <clears throat> however, so I, I just, you know, we talked about taste here, and I talked about the five uh, modalities of taste, but much of taste is actually smell. We, we, when we eat something, when we taste something, that the experience of that is really complex, much more complex than, you know, the possibility of five taste modalities would um, seem to allow for. And that is actually coming from our sense of smell. This probably is not news to many of you. Um, so I don't know if I've never tried this, but I've heard maybe it's apocryphal, but the thing where like eating a strawberry, they did some study where uh, they gave kids, uh, they plugged their nose completely and they blindfolded them and gave them strawberries and asked them 
to identify what it was that they were eating. And, um, well, I don't know. I, I haven't actually seen the study, but uh, somebody was telling me about it. But the um, they had a very hard time identifying what it was. Uh, I don't know, something like 40 or 50% of them couldn't identify what it was that they were eating, but that went up significantly when they un- plugged their nose. So something like, you know, 90% of them could tell what it was when, when they were able to um, access their nose. It's pretty mysterious though. So the way your sense of smell works here is uh, there's the olfactory bulb that comes in uh, along the base of your brain. It's one of the cranial nerves and sends these little rootlets down into the olfactory epithelium that gets coated in this layer of mucus and the odorants, these, um, these compounds that elicit smell, uh, get attached and you get dissolved into the mucus and uh, trigger these chemical, these chemo, what are called chemo receptors, chemical receptors that then send signals up to the brain. So this uh, sense of olfaction can, dis can distinguish actually thousands of different uh, chemicals. Um, and your central nervous system is able to interpret all these smells by the complex pattern of receptor activity that happens uh, during olfaction. Olfaction is far more sophisticated than taste, far more sophisticated than taste. All right, so um, if your sense of smell is reactive to thousands of chemical stimuli, where do these chemicals come from? Welcome to Flavortown. Uh, it's the Maillard reaction. So the Maillard reaction was initially uh, discovered by this guy named uh, Louis Cam Camille Maillard. And um, he discovered the uh, reaction that happens between sugars and proteins, uh, re uh, reducing sugar, so a free sugar that's able to open and close, ring open and ring close. Uh, and an amino acid that happens at, at high temperatures. Um, and it gives the complex flavor profile of all these foods. Maybe Maillard's uh, favorite cup of espresso and a, and a croissant, or maybe uh, this uh, guy Fieri here, uh, beer fries and ribs. All of these foods, uh, the complex and delicious flavors that we love in them, come from the Maillard reaction. Um, so <clears throat> these are just pictures of Maillard as he uh, grew older, always a dapper dude. Um, so it's this Maillard reaction that, that not only causes the change in uh, flavor, but also the change in color in food. Uh, it usually happens above 140 degrees C, uh, so that's 285. Um, and you look at this picture here, uh, on the left-hand side we have chicken, a chicken breast, and some carrots that were uh, cooked below 200 degrees Fahrenheit. So they were essentially boiled. Uh, boiled carrots, boiled chicken. Has anyone had boiled carrots and boiled chicken? A little bit flavorless. A little bit flavorless. However, if you sear them, on, and on the right we see these like caramelized carrots, caramelized uh, browned skin, browned uh, flesh on the, on the chicken breast, it's going to have a lot more flavor to it. This is the Maillard reaction. So this Maillard reaction happens in three stages. Uh, and I, I already told you that it happens between a reducing sugar and an amino acid. So on the left-hand side here, in number one, uh, we have a reducing sugar. In fact, that's glucose. That's the open chain form of glucose. If you look, it's, there's, if you count it out, there's six carbons in the chain, and each of those carbons has a hydroxyl group attached to it, just like uh, hopefully throwing your mind back to the carbohydrate chapter. And the terminal carbon, this is an aldose, so that terminal carbon is the one that carries the carbonyl group. It's that carbonyl group uh, that's going to interact with the free amino group on the end of some amino acid, uh, or it can be a protein, uh, longer chain. So uh, there's the amino group on one side. The R group, uh, you'll remember, is what makes that amino acid uh, the individual amino acid it is, whether it's alanine, glycine, lysine, leucine, all that stuff, tryptophan. Uh, 
um, and they react uh, and form this product on the right hand side. Um, a and this is called a glycosylamine, um, where the carbon that had a double bond O to it forms a double bond to the nitrogen. And we basically have just pulled water out. We've just, again, this is kind of a condensation reaction, right? We've seen these before as we put together fatty acids. We've seen them to, um, before as we put together uh, carbohydrates with the glycosidic bond. We're doing the same thing here. We're pulling out water and we're forming that double bond between the carbon and the nitrogen. So that's, that's the first step of this. The next step is what's kind of uh, the miraculous thing. We call this the Amadori rearrangement. Uh, and it was named after a guy named Mario Amadori, of which there is shockingly little information that I was able to find. He was an Italian chemist uh, that discovered this in like 1925. Uh, he, he characterized this rearrangement. So rearrangement is going to turn out to be really important for a lot of reasons. But um, we go from uh, the glycosylamine that was in the upper right-hand corner, and we go through this uh, uh, N-aminol intermediate to get this Amadori compound. And if you look at what happened here, uh, going from the glycosylamine uh, to the ketosamine now, the Amadori compound, the double bond just shifted from the C and the N, which is actually unstable, uh, it shifted over to the next oxygen down the chain uh, onto C2 in the former sugar, all right? Uh, so this is a little bit of a, a shift. You can see the double bond just kind of like leapfrogs along the bond chain uh, to get to uh, that carbonyl group on, on the O2. That's the Amadori compound. Uh, and then from the Amadori product, this is where we can explode, all right? Uh, if you are doing this reaction in an acidic condition, uh, then you can get hydroxy, a compound called hydroxymethyl uh, furfural, which um, can then go into hundreds uh, of different browning products and flavor compounds from that. It's very reactive, and I'm not going to take you down a daunting rabbit hole there. Uh, or if this reaction is, uh, takes place under alkaline conditions, that means uh, basic conditions. So like, for example, in bread, maybe you're adding baking powder or baking soda, not baking powder, but baking soda uh, to alkalize uh, that environment. You're going to change the type of Maillard reactions uh, that the Amadori product rearrangements that you're going to have you can get these fission products and then this really large, complex uh, category of compounds called reduct <laughs> reductones. I'm giving you two, just examples of two reductones there. You're not going to have to draw those. Uh, but reductones, uh, are, what you should know is that reductones come from the alkaline conditions. And there, again, are thousands of different uh, ways that these reductones can go from there. It gets quite complicated. Uh, and the reason for that is these are the potential reducing sugars that you're going to find. So it could be glucose. It can be fructose. It could be xylose. Uh, we saw xylose in the psyllium in that, uh, in that um, uh, insoluble fiber that I showed you. Uh, it could be mannose. It could be galactose. Ribose. Uh, it can be ribose from some DNA that may uh, exist in the whatever it is that you're cooking. And all of those could potentially react with any of the 20 amino acids. And, and those end products, depending upon whether it's acid or base, and whatever temperature we're at, can go into literally tens of thousands of different flavor compounds, bringing you to Flavortown. All right. So um, here are some categories of these products. These my, and this is, again, a very small subset. I told you there were, were tens of thousands. Actually, I should change that. It's not hundreds. It's tens of thousands of products. Of hundreds of them, and maybe thousands, have really distinctive, unique flavors uh, that break into these categories. Uh, some of them, uh, so, and there's, there's some structural motifs to them, as you can tell. Uh, Sulfur-containing compounds are really important. 
they give you that meaty roasted flavor. So to have sulfur containing ones, it's going to have to have the, the protein, typically meat is going to have uh, a lot of methionine or cysteine, some kind of sulfur containing amino acid in it. Um, you can get uh, cereal like nutty flavor from the pyroles. The oxidols have kind of a green, nutty, sweet flavor to them. Uh, the furans and the furanones and can have sort of a caramely flavor to them, sometimes meaty, sometimes burnt. Uh, the pyrazines uh, also taste kind of roasted and toasted. Uh, and then we can get these sort of like astringent and bitter flavors out of the alkyl, alkyl pyridines and the acyl pyridines uh, that can range from like bitter or astringent to uh, kind of like a crackery flavor or a cereal type flavor. So the, the wide range of, of flavors that you get are derived from these uh, categories of flavor molecules that are going to interact with your olfactory uh, epithelium in your nose to give you the kind of flavors uh, that you experience uh, during cooking. Um, and then that, that's just flavor. Color comes from these compounds called the melanoidins, uh, polymeric structures which are going to contribute to the flavor of cooked foods. They're super complicated molecules. I feel like I've already thrown a lot of molecules at you, uh, but I'm just throwing them up there so you can see them. Uh, this is a chart that helps you determine, uh, the, this, this is the standard reference method for determining the color of beer. Uh, and uh, any of these colors are going to be produced by a range of these different melanoidins that might be present during the malting process in, in beer. Um, yeah, so obviously a lot of breweries are taking advantage of this. Um, <clears throat> So this is the last slide here that I really want to talk about. Yeah, well, this is caramelization. That's not so important for Monday. Um, so the, the basic concept here, this is like a, a temperature range that a food may find itself on going from uncooked uh, or raw at around, you know, 20 degrees centigrade, 70 degrees Fahrenheit, so room temperature. Uh, you know, for most meats, pork, it's around 140, uh, beef, it's about 160, poultry, it's about 165. Uh, if you can get the meat to that, the internal temperature of the meat to that level, then it's considered to be safe to eat. Um, however, it, um, just because it's safe to eat doesn't mean it's flavorsome. So even up to 100 degrees C or 212 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, which is steamed, that is bland. It's bland. You don't have uh, the Maillard reaction. The Maillard reaction starts at around 250 degrees Fahrenheit, goes to about 300. So there's like this 50 degree range in there between 250 and 300 where you get um, a lot of the delicious flavors. Uh, once you get above 300, you start moving out of Maillard range and move into caramelization where the sugars are more prone to interact with each other than interact with the amino acids. All right. And caramelization uh, is that next slide where it's a sweet thing, right? It's the, the sugars that are reacting. Above, like by the time you get to 400, you're, you're, it's burnt and it doesn't really uh, taste good at all. Um, so when you're looking at the, the bird or the bread, uh, the inside of the bread is not going to go above 165. The inside of the bird won't go above 165. But the surface uh, that's in contact with the pan or in the air on the bread where the crust forms, this is going to get much above that internal temperature and give you the flavor profile from these Maillard products that, uh, that we're looking for, for the, the tasty uh, bread, turkey, and, and, and rolls for Thanksgiving. Okay, that's it. Um,